Grace and peace be upon you, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and welcome you back uh, to another Bible study. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church. Uh, give honor to God, uh, who is indeed, uh, should be indeed, the head of all of our lives. Amen. Uh, we, we honor his holy majesty. Um, without God, without his mercies, there is no us. Amen. Without his son, Jesus Christ, uh, king of all kings, without his son interceding for us, uh, there is no hope. There is no peace. I like to believe that our Bible studies are sponsored by the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, God Almighty. Uh, once again, this is our Bible study. Today we'll be teaching, uh, Lord willing, from uh, the 15th chapter of Exodus. Exodus represents the second book of Moses, uh, chapter 15 and quite possibly chapter 16. Amen. Uh, before we get started, folks, I'd like to take this opportunity to also uh, let our brothers and sisters over there on the East Coast uh, not only just on the East Coast, those countries that have experienced uh, uh, the likes of Hurricane Sandy, uh, we're praying for you. Uh, it's not enough to say that we're praying. Uh, we're doing what we can uh, to make sure that our brothers and sisters have what they need. Uh, but we also spend, spend our time praying. Um, it seems to be that just after you've gotten out of one storm, yet here comes uh, something else. Um, so it's easier said than done, but, but, you know, we all have to endure, uh, uh, something. I'm not in your situation. Um, but I am praying, amen. And, and we should all be praying, uh, uh, you know, for those that are, that are over there, that they, that they have what they need. And folks, if you can, uh, if you have to give, if you have the power to give, you want to make sure that you do what you can. You want to make sure that you play your part, uh, this is what the kingdom of God is all about, folks. This is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And uh, we don't wait for the world to do what his kingdom should be doing. Amen. So uh, anyway, going on with our Bible study, if you don't have Bibles, uh, don't worry about it. You can go to our website, www.ubcchurch.org. You ought to see it come up on the screen. Um, go to our website. You want to click on the online Bible tab once you get to our website. Uh, after you click on that tab, it's going to take you to a page that has a box in the center of the page. Uh, if you click inside that box, there's a blank space at the top of the box uh, with an arrow. If you click inside that box, it will drop down uh, the different books of the Bible. You want to make sure you select Exodus. Amen. And and obviously, you want to select the 16th chapter. And that way, you'll be able to follow us verse per verse. Say, Ben. Uh, also, our prayer requests, we'll go through all of the formalities before we hit our Bible study. So uh, as far as our prayer request, uh, those of you that that uh, that are watching our website, uh, watching our videos via our website, and even those of you that are watching this through YouTube, if you go to our website and click on the prayer request tab, uh, once you click on that tab, it'll bring up a page which will allow you to fill out that confidential information, that being your name, email address, and uh, the petition that you're seeking from God, amen, or, or the whatever you want, whatever it is that you are seeking from God. Um, we should all have an established prayer lives, and, and, and you will be tested, as we're going to see today in our Bible study, that there are some things that God does test us with. But these the, the tests are to, to uh, uh, you know, to strengthen us, if you will. And, and unfortunately, our brothers and sisters out on the East Coast, they, they are going through some things there. But but we pray that you continue to persevere and you want to make sure that you have a prayer life that's going to take the edge off the pain as you're spending your time praying. I can't say it enough. If you go into the Gospels and you see the Lord Jesus Christ when he was in the, the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying and he was asking his father uh, God in heaven, uh, if if that cup could be removed from him, that cup that he was to drink from, he said, nevertheless, be it your will. Uh, as the scripture says, after he got done praying, the strength, the, the angels came to encourage him. Amen. Uh, so what am I saying with that? 
that you're going to have times that you get weak because of the things that you are tried, the way that you are tried, the things that begin to try you. But you want to make sure that you're staying prayed up. And, and sometimes if you're not real consistent in prayer, it's kind of hard to go to God. But that's what the devil wants. He wants you to shy away from going to God. You want to be able to go to him. I don't care if you're not consistent. You want to go to him. Don't let the devil rob you from your strength. Believe it or not, the scripture says that when you are weak, God's strength is made perfect in you. Amen. It is that he tries us and we get and when we get to the point uh, that we can't take it no more, he shows up and he shows out for us. Anyway, once you hit the submit button, my wife and I do receive that prayer request. We'll go through it, read through it and make sure that it lines up with the word and the will of God. We'll take it to prayer. Amen. Uh, I won't I won't hold you over. I want to uh, try to get through this Bible study here. I spend a lot of time talking, but uh, we, we definitely want to get to the Bible study. So uh, if you uh, join me in prayer, and then we'll go right into the scriptures here. Eternal God, we bless you. Thank you for an opportunity to come before you, God. All praises be unto you, God, because you are holy and you are mighty and you are forever, O oh God. Father, you make your word simple. You allow us to understand and you allow us to retain. Father, we come before you and we give unto you this moment in our lives, O oh God. And we thank you that your throne was made accessible through Jesus the Christ. So Jesus, we bless you and we thank you for making your father's throne accessible. Jesus, thank you for giving us the strength to be able to come before you and your father this day. Now, God, as we come before you, we thank you for this opportunity, God. Thank you for the opportunity to get to know you. Thank you for the opportunity to love you. Thank you for the opportunity to learn of you, that we may take a part of you and plant it within our own vessels, oh God, that we may grow in God, that we may, that our relationships would be cultivated in you, oh God, that we would find ourselves being obedient you know, just by the ordinances of your word, O oh God, Father, that we would take your words and the stories, O oh God, of, of those times before and share them with those that would seek to serve you, O oh God. Father, bless you for allowing us to have the knowledge and the understanding of you. Thank you for the power, O oh, oh God, that's coming forth from the Holy Ghost in teaching this lesson. Father, in the name of Jesus, we seek to, to please and to praise you, O oh God. Let this word manifest within our lives. Let us walk away from this Bible study with understanding after the completion thereof. God, you be glorified. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Ghost come forth in power and let it have its way. Let not mine opinion stand in the way of your truth, O oh God. Let me stand behind the teacher, O oh God, for I am a, a pupil, a disciple in thy class, O oh God. Thank you for allowing us to be present this day. Thank you for your Holy Ghost coming forth this day. Let your word be blessed, for Father, you are blessed. Those that are in other nations, O oh God, let there not be a translation barrier. Let them understand this, this teaching even as we understand. Father, allow me to say those things that you would have me to say. Allow me to teach your truth, O oh God. Father, in the name of Jesus, be ye magnified from this Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, we've last, uh, last time we were in Exodus, we actually had an opportunity to cover uh, uh, the, the parting of the Red Sea, amen. And uh, Pharaoh and his men, uh, came after after the children of Israel to slaughter them, amen. Uh, kind of symbolic how the enemy is today. He comes, he enslaves us, and then when we break loose from, when God deliver us from him, he looks to kill us. He looks to, to make sure that we are crippled. A hey, God, he looks, it's almost like he wants to penalize us because we left his arena of death. He had us in chains and bonds while we were serving him. He was our taskmaster, just like Pharaoh was to the to the uh, children of Is to the children of Israel 
That's how the devil has been to us. He's been our taskmaster. Amen. And as soon as we break loose from him, guess what? He's not happy with that. He begins to throw everything at you, including the kitchen sink. Amen. So chapter 15 uh, picks up uh, where where we left off at in, in chapter 14. It, it, it gives the, the children of Israel begin to praise God for yet his deliverance, because this is the second time he's delivered them. He delivered them out of the land of Egypt from the hands of Pharaoh. And then this time he delivered them from Pharaoh again to where they would never again have to worry about Pharaoh. Amen. So we'll go right into uh, chapter 15, uh, the book of Exodus, starting at verse one. It says, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song until, until the Lord. They begin to serenade God. They sang this song unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horses and its rider has th has been thrown into the sea. Those that came after them, the, 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 their singing is praises to God because he's delivered them. It says, verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song and he became he become my salvation he is my god and i will prepare him a habitation and as they're singing it's like their spirit is serenading god watch what they say here in verse two i will prepare him a habitation i'm going to make my surroundings holy so the look so the good lord can dwell with me see when god delivers you you want to make sure that you keep his presence you don't just want him to pull you out pull you out of whatever mess you was in and then he take off. You want him to stay with you. You want to abide with him and have him abide with you. So as they're singing praises, they're declaring that for now on, they're going to make their surroundings holy so that God can dwell in the midst of them. Amen. It goes on to say here, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war and the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariot and his host had has he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also drowned in the Red Sea. And it, and it says when they said that his chosen his chosen captains, which was his elite soldiers, they're going to they're they're singing who can stand before the Lord. King Pharaoh, which was a mighty man of valor, which is, I can't call him a mighty man of valor, but a mighty man known throughout the world. Not only him, but he had his entourage come after them. The children of Israel going to say, who can stand before God? And that's how you got to understand. If God be for you, who and what can be against you? Amen. It goes on to say the depths in verse five have covered them. They sink into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed pieces of the enemy. It said, the greatness of thine excellency has overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath. And, and understand this. You being the child of God, if the enemy rises up at, is if he rises up at you, then he rising up at God because what's happening if if he does it to you remember what remember what Jesus said to to uh, Saul in in, in the uh, in in the uh, uh, the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles he says Saul uh, why persecutest thou me and what he was saying is whatever you do to my disciples you're doing unto him you were doing unto the Lord Jesus Christ well it's the same here whatever Pharaoh was doing unto the children of Israel then he was doing unto God. Amen. Uh, verse, uh, so verse, verse uh, seven, and the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed a mass stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. And, and when it say the depths were con congealed or the depths were made firm, the depths begin to solidify, if you will. The depths of the sea begin to, to solidify and smother them or drown them, amen? And, and then they're also referencing the command that God had over the water. It said by his nostrils, the sea split 
and, and, and begin to mound up as heaps of watery or mounds, if you will. Man, their song of praise is making me want to give God some praise because this is the same God. This is the same power that exists then. The same power exists now. Uh, verse 9, and the enemy said, I will pursue. Now, this is what the enemy is saying to us too. I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. Uh, my hand shall destroy them. When God pulls you out, uh, from the chains that the enemy uh, has, has had us in. He's not satisfied that, that, you're, that you're partying and all he can do is watch you go dressed up uh, as a child of God. He wants revenge, amen? So he begins to come after us and he begins to release a fury after us. And it seems like, after, and he waits for the perfect moment he waits, uh, uh, you know, for, for as, as, as you begin to walk with God, it seems like you can't be touched. But eventually, uh, little things start happening and have you weak. You know, little things begin to happen. And, and the more things happen, uh, the, the more you try to then when the enemy thinks it's the right time, he begin to send everything at you. Amen. And that's what happened here. The enemy, as he let him go, he began to send everything after them, not only himself, but all of his men, chosen men, he began to send everybody and everything. Uh, but uh, again, thus being the children of the most high God, if he's coming after us, then he's coming after God. And good luck with that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> verse, uh, verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty water. And have God ever delivered you from something and you cannot help but praise him? I mean, when you talk to God right now, is it is it pity or is it praise? Do you, when you come to God, is it woe is me or bless you? Because things, no matter what it looked like, it didn't get the best of me. It tried but it only pushed me closer to your arms. Has, ha, ha, have you had moments like that? Do you, when you come to God, is it all pitiful? Oh, Lord, I need you without you. I, I just can't do this. Lord, you know, pay my bills. Lord, This just if you just feed me today, Lord, you know. I, is, how is your praise? How is it? Because he delivered them. Amen. They got something to sing about because he delivered them. If it's hard for you to praise him, think about when he had delivered you. Amen. Think about what he had delivered you. When he did, when, when he opened up his shirt and you seen this big G on his chest and he came in, swooped in, pulled you out and made your enemies your footstool. That might be a long time for a lot of y'all to remember because you might not you might not have been walking with him, you know, anymore after that. He is worthy to be praised, amen. Uh, going on with the Bible study here, verse eleven: Who was like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, or among the great ones, among the mighty ones? Who was like unto you, O God? Who was like you? Who was like thee, glorious in holiness? Fearful when praises, doing wonders. Who can do what you do? Who can do it? Who can make this world revolve around in its place? And while it's revolving in its place, the whole galaxy is, is revolving as well. So you got the planet revolving this way, and then you got the galaxy also revolving. And as our days turn, as one area of the world is night is sleeping the other day is getting rest and because of the global position uh, or universal position that's to say i should say one of one part of the planet is in summer while the other part seems to have a winter it's, it's this is the phenomenal aspect of god who is like god who can part these waters like he did amen god is worthy amen uh, verse 12, thou stretches out thy right hand and the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou has redeemed. Thou has guided them in thy, thy strength unto the holy habitation. 
the people shall hear it and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of Palestinia or Palestinia. I mean, that Palestinia uh, translate to Felicia, Felicia if you will, P H I L I S T I A, which is actually Philistine, or uh, yeah, yeah, the 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 the, the Philistines, the Philistines, Amen. And they're beginning, as they begin to praise God, they're also going to praise him in advance for what he's going to do later. Amen? That's the thing about praises. They continually, they should continually fall from your lips. You know, amen? You ever start praying to God and you start out with a woe is me, but then all of a sudden you start praising him? You just, you, you just, all of a sudden you just start praising. You know why? Because a lot of times your spirit don't really know what to pray for. Your mind do, but your spirit, I'm sorry, your mind don't know what to pray for. Amen. Your spirit does, but your mind don't. Your mind gets to the point that it just wants to tell God what's been on its mind, but your spirit gets within the presence of God and want to praise him like those elders do in, 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 in the uh, book of Revelation, your spirit begins to pray to God. Your spirit all know, your spirit always know what to say to God and always know what to pray to God. Amen. And your spirit will begin to praise them and got your tongue praising them. You don't have to speak in tongues. You just be, you'll start off praying, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for this day. And uh, then all of a sudden, you're like, God, you're awesome. You are mighty. You are holy, God. You are righteous, God. You are powerful. God, I could have been dead, but you saved me that I could love you. All of a sudden, you just start praising God. They're praising him, not only for what he brought them out of, but what he's going to bring them out of. They start praising him in advance. Amen. Watch this in verse 15. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. They ain't even got to that part yet, but they're praising them in advance. Verse 16, fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, uh, thine arm they shall be as still as a stone till the people pass over. O oh Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. When God rips you out of the enemy's care, and all this happened because they called on God. Do you understand? God, When God came to Moses, he told Moses, I've heard their cry. God came because they summonsed him. They called on God, and he came to the rescue. And they bless him because he came to the rescue. And they're saying that even though they called on God, God said that he put in a purchase order. He said, y'all didn't call on me. I called on you. That's why I came to get you. We think we calling on God, but he's actually calling on us. A lot of times that's why we're going through because he's calling on us to go through so he can pull us out and that he can, he can, he can right our wrongs. He can have us. Cause let me let me be honest with you, if a lot of us didn't have tribulation while we would while we while we were in our mess, we would still be in our mess. Amen. If a lot of us didn't have tribulation in the midst of our mess, we would still be in our mess. It takes your mess to get bad before you running out for your life or you trying to get out by the hairs of your chin. If your mess was still pleasurable to you, you would have no reason to call on God. Amen. <laughs> if it, if your mess felt good, you wouldn't be saved right now. It 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 felt good to draw you in, but then it got bad, you know, and you got caught in it in the midst of it collapsing on you. God had to come rescue you. Amen. Uh, so it's saying the scripture saying that God purchased us. He purchased it. He wiped the debt clean. In Pharaoh's case, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh God. <laughs> Pharaoh had to pay that debt with his life. God owned us now, amen. Uh, verse 17, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountains of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thine hands have established. 
The same thing he did for the children of Israel then is what he's doing for us. He bring you out from the world, clean you up, begin to to uh, reprogram you in a sense, to establish his precepts with you because his word cleans you. His word does. The more word you have, the more you start to clean out. Amen. And uh, what happens is he's not trying to clean you up and keep you here. He's trying to keep you. He's trying to clean you and take you to a place where he can dwell with you. Amen. He wants to. You know what God is guilty of? He's guilty of loving you so much. He's guilty of. He's, he's like a husband or like a father trying to, to uh, put a roof over your head, trying to bring you to a place, trying to provide, trying to make sure you have the best of his world, trying to make sure you have all of him. That's what he's guilty of, loving you, wanting to make sure that you succeed, wanting to make sure that you and him grow together, wanting to make sure that he walks and, and talk with you, that he hears from you. This is what he's guilty of. He's guilty of chasing after you. Amen. He's guilty of loving you that much. Going on here, uh, the Lord in verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. And that's what he wants from you. He wants you to be with him in that forever. Verse 19, for the horses of Pharaoh went in with his chariots, uh, with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. This is still, this is still a song that they serenading God with that's, that's turning out to be a rendition of praises to God. Amen. Because of what he's done. He's done a miracle on behalf of them. Amen. Verse 20. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, uh, took a, a, a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out. Af all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, saying ye to the Lord, serenade him is what she's saying, for he have trumpet. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea. Verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went, they went out of the wilderness of Shur and they went three days into the wilderness and they found no water. <laughs> and when they came to uh, Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, or the name Mara means bitter. Now, watch what happens here. Verse 24. The people murmured against Moses. Now, murmured is grunt. They, they grumbled, amen, or they began to talk under their breath against Moses. Moses saying, against Moses, and this is what they said, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made statues and ordinance, and there he proved them, or there he, them, them at that time, he tested them. Now it said that he seen the tree, that God seen the tree, and God took the tree and he casted it into the waters and made the waters sweet. Now, <laughs> he did the tree like a tea bag. <laughs> he got to, to grab the tree and begin to dip it in the water to to make the water flavored water. He basically made some Kool-Aid out the tree. Amen. He took the tree and dipped it into the water and made some sweet water out of it. And he said that he tested and he began to prove them. He gave them some ordinances because within the ordinances that he gave them, he wanted to test them to see if you know if they was going to line up with what he said now this is a decontamination process because they came out of egypt but egypt was still in them so he wanted to see how much would they be willing to walk with him are they willing to walk with him that extra mile that as it getting hard as it gets hard would they get going or would they stay with them in the midst of hardness 
Amen. In the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulation. Amen. So <laughs> they remember they already see the first the first complaint after the praise comes the complaint. We ain't got no water. And all that singing that they did, as soon as a little bit of adversity come their way, like thirst, a little bit of adversity come their way, all the singing that, that they did, the, the, the praising God and how he split the waters with his nostrils and how he diced his enemies into pieces. And then he's going to do this and do that to Canaan. They seem to forgot all that. You know, and all they can see, they, they, they was in the midst of their praises, they was able to see ahead of them. They was able to see behind them. But in the midst of their complaint, all they can do is see what's in front of them. They can't see beyond their complaint. But everything was clear when they was praising God. But it's all distorted when you begin to curse some things. Amen. Verse 26 and said, if thou wilt, and this is what God says to them, and this applies to us too. This is what God says. If thou wilt diligently, and diligently is consistent. If thou wilt consistently listen and obey. He says, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. If thou wilt do that which is right in his sight. If thou wilt give ear to his commandments. And keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which are brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, understand what he said. As long as you obey and that you don't disobey, you won't be subject to sin and sin will lead to death. He said, as long as you, as long as you ride with me, as long as you roll with me, as long as you are consistent. Another thing that God don't like, He's even in the book of Revelations, he don't like us to be lukewarm. He don't like us with one foot in and one foot out. You either all in or you all out. He's that's why he said, I need you to be diligent or I need you to be consistent. And he said, as long as you stay consistent, I won't let the destroyer come upon you as, as the destroyer had came upon Egypt. Basically, I won't protect you. When the destroyer comes to make you reap for the sins that you've sown. Amen. I won't stand in the way when it comes. But if you do good, you'll never have to worry about the destroyer coming after you. Amen. And this is what he's telling them. He says, for I am the Lord God that healeth thee. Well, I'm the one that restored you. I'm the one that made you whole. Amen. Verse 27. And they came to Elam. Uh, were about 12 where there was about 12 wells of water and three score and 10 palm trees or about 70 palm trees and they stayed there or they encamped there by the waters so we'll go right in uh, uh chapter 16 of exodus it looked like we got a little time here uh so uh exodus chapter 16 verse 1 and they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the, and this was on the 15th day of the second month of their departing out of the land of Egypt. Verse 2, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel began to complain against Moses and Aaron in the, in the midst of the wilderness. The whole congregation. <laughs> And the children of Israel said unto them, What to God that we had died by the hands of the Lord in the land of Egypt uh, when we sat by the flesh pots or by the meat or by the pots filled with meat. Um, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth in the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> when, when you're praising God, there is clarity. You are able to see where you were, how he pulled you out, where you are now, and how with God, you'll be down the road. You can see these things, and it brings forth praise. And, and it's a spiritual thing, too, because it's not in the midst of you praising, it's not about you. It's about God. But in the midst of complaint, it's not about God. It's about you. Do you understand? When you're praising God, 
It's never about you. It's about him, how good he is to you, how awesome he is, how he is number one, how he is your daddy, how he how he is this your personal savior. It's all about him. <laughs> but when you begin to complain, it becomes about you. You because what you what what's happening is your flesh is talking through your mouth. Amen. Your flesh is starting to dictate. And it's, 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 your flesh has become your God because now instead of listening to God, you begin to listen to your flesh. And the flesh is saying, man, remember when you had those chains on you? Remember when you was back in Egypt? Man, remember when you was serving the Egyptians? Remember when you was by all that pot of food that they had up in those pots? Remember when they let you have some bread? Oh, man, that bread had butter on there. Man, it sure would have been nice. Shoot, it would have been better if we were back in Egypt because even if we would have died with the Egyptians, we would have died with a full stomach. <laughs> so you, do you, you see where I'm going with this? When you're listening to your flesh, it can only see right now it can only see what's in front <coughs> excuse me it can only see what's in front your flesh forgets you see your flesh you this is why the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight because when you walk by sight you walking by your flesh and your flesh can't handle the journey it can't where god wants to take you your flesh goes second your spirit man comes first your flesh can't handle that. It, your flesh does better with captivity and bondage. It doesn't do liberty good. <laughs> with liberty, your flesh gets you in more trouble. With liberty, your flesh will get you killed. But in bondage, you are tamed. But see, with God, God don't want you in bondage. He wants you free. But in the midst of freedom, your flesh gets in a way to try to put you back in captivity. And that's what's happening with the children of Israel. Along this journey, first there was a complaint about water. So not only did he give them waters, he sweetened the water. He seasoned the water that it was sweet. And instead of them thanking him and praising him, the next thing they come up out of their mouth is, man, I remember it, it, it would it be for God. It probably would have been better for God had he just left us back in Egypt to die with the Egyptians. At least we would have died on a full belly. There's some old crazy stuff. So it is what it is, folks. Amen. Uh, verse three. And the children of Israel said unto them, as we read this, uh, let's go to verse four. We already uh, read verse three. Uh, then, then said the Lord, Unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day or a certain amount daily, that I may test them whether they walk in my laws or whether, or whether they won't. Uh, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day that they shall prepare that which they bring in, and that and and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So six uh, so so six days do they gather this food and on the seventh they don't so on the sixth day because they're not gathering things on it the, because they're not gathering food on the seventh day when they go out to gather food on the sixth day they should bring in a double portion because they won't be out the next day and moses and aaron and god is serious about this rest thing you know, some of you that got jobs, and, and, and Lord knows I'm guilty of it too, folks. You know, I'll get a job, and, and, and sometime, uh, um, you know, I, I'm working seven days a week, amen? And that's not fitting uh, for God, you know? He, he, he wants you to be able to rest, amen? Because he rests. He wants us to be like him. He rested, and he wants us to rest. Uh, and Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel in verse six at evening, then you shall know that the Lord had brought you up from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord for that he heareth your complaints against the Lord. And what, 
And what are we that ye murmur against us? So <laughs> they said, as God will feed you, you're going to see the glory of God when you go out and get your food and, and how accessible your food is when you go in and go get it. You're going to know that only God can provide for you like that. And speaking of God being the only one to provide for you, what's the deal with you complaining against Aaron and myself? We ain't got nothing to do with you eating. That's God. Your complaint shouldn't be against us. <laughs> if you got a problem with me, you need to go see God. I'm only the messenger. <laughs> so Aaron and Moses had to make sure that they get the point across. Um, uh, verse 8, and Moses said, this shall be that when the Lord shall give you uh, in the evening flesh to eat and then the morning bread to be full for the Lord heareth your murmurs which you murmur against him your grumblings, your complaints he says and what are we your murmurs are not against us it's against the Lord and Moses and, and Moses uh, spake unto Aaron saying, uh, and, and saying unto all the congregation of Israel come near unto the Lord it says for he hath heard your murmurings and it came to pass that as Aaron spoke unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses. And and, and you ever you ever been at work? <laughs> you ever been at work and you complain about the way things are going on your job? Uh, you know as though you could do it better, right? You know, you complain about, you know, the way the boss has been, the, the way that the, the, maybe if you work with the public, the way the public is, or those that you work under, you begin to complain about them. And lo and behold, the very person that you're complaining about, and you murmuring, you're doing it under your breath because it's not meant for them to hear, amen? And so, lo and behold, in the midst of you jaw jacking, <laughs> Guess what? The very person that you're talking about happened to be behind you or happened to be in the midst of the conversation, you know, right there as you're talking and you don't know that they've heard you. Has that ever happened to you? Amen. This is why our mouths should be used for eating, eating, praising, and edifying. Amen. <laughs> Never tearing down folk with this, with this device. This device that you got right here. If you let the wrong thing use it, it can tear some stuff up. It can curse some things. Amen. We're talking about your mouth. That tongue of yours is a deadly weapon. And it leaves lashes uh, uh, that, that takes longer than healed than lashes from a belt. Amen. So you want to make sure you're mindful. And, and who were they to believe that God wouldn't hear them? God hears you too. All that complaint. You don't like that God is above. He does too much for us uh, to, to for us to be found complaining. Amen. Anybody, you can if you look at your life and you, you begin to take an assessment and evaluation of where you are, and you, you'll always find some reason to complain. But if you look at where God has brought you from, man, you can't help but praise Him. You can't help but thank Him. Because of where you are and where you've been, how he's cleaned you up, cleaned you out, delivered you. You may not where you may not be where you want to be, but you're not where you used to be. And the, and the fact that you're not where you once were, it's enough to bless him. It's enough to praise him. There should never be a complaint coming from your mouth. Sometimes your kids are going to make you angry, you know, but those things that you say, make sure you say to your kids in an effort to rear them up, not complain. My kid ain't no good. They'll never be no good. You know, that's not the things that you say. I hate this job. That job, the feeling is probably mutual. <laughs> hey, man. When you're complaining, it's because you carry a, a bad disposition. It's a negative disposition. And God is not a negative God. If he was, he'd have left them people up in there to die. He'd have left you in your mess. God is a positive God, an awesome God. They're still discovering new and different creatures out here. It's the imagination of God. 
He's always creating things for his glory. It's a positive God. Amen. Uh, going on with this here. This is verse 12. I've heard the murmurings of the children. And, and, and as, as, the, as Aaron called the congregation together, they look and they see the they see the cloud. They know that that's God, and 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 Aaron let them know. Oh yeah, by the way, there go God, and He heard you. So whatever you got to say, go on and let Him know. <laughs> if He was talking bad about your boss, and He came there, and your boss was like, "What was that that you said?" Oh no, I, I wouldn't. I, I, <laughs> you didn't catch the conversation from the beginning. I was talking about so and so. You ever said something against your parents and didn't know your parents was there, didn't know that they heard you and they bust you in your mouth? You ever, you ever, you ever had that happen to you? So there, you know, Aaron called the congregation together. He was like, yo, by the way, there go God. Now, what was that that you were saying? So verse, verse 13. And it came to pass that at the evening, the quails came up. I'm sorry. Let me read 12 one more time. Um, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying that at the evening ye shall eat flesh. And he's talking about quails. They're like pigeons, or, or um, they're not like pigeons. They're like uh, um, it's a, it's a different kind of bird. It's not like a pigeon. It's a little bit. It's better than that. I I forgot what kind of bird it was. Uh, but they're going quail. You, you're thinking about the bird. That's the flesh that he's telling them to eat. So y'all gonna be eating eating chicken in the morning and corn. Y'all gonna eat chicken that night and cornbread in the morning. Amen. <laughs> so this is kind of the picture right here. Amen. Um, but going on with verse 12, at evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you should be filled with the bread. And you shall know that I'm the Lord your God. Basically, you're going to know that I'm the one that provides for you. Nobody provided for you but me. It's me. I am didn't bring you out of there to, to make you starve. I brought you out. I want you to get fattened up by me. I want to grow with you. Amen. Uh, verse 13, and it came to pass that that evening the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew laid around about the host. So in the morning, so so in the morning, they wake up. And after the dew, you know, once the dew falls, the dew is on the ground. And once the dew rises in the midst of the place of the dew is all this sweet wafer like bread. And then, and then all of a sudden, uh, it says in the evening, the quails came up, nothing but the nothing but these birds all around them, and all they got to do is prepare it. It's it's they don't even really have to go hunt. All they have to do is go gather. They don't have to hunt. It's right there. He, the Lord brought it to them like he did with them, like he did with Noah. He brings the animals to Noah so that they can board. All Noah had to do was was set with the boarding pass. He had to set with his manifest and check them out. God did all the work. The animals were even obedient. Well, it's the same thing God did here with the quails. They didn't have to go hunt. They didn't have to learn how to use a bow and an arrow, you know, sharpen up the, the little arrowhead and and, and fasten a, 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 a arrow, you know, from, they didn't have to go learn none of that. They didn't have to be huntsmen, gamesmen or anything. All they needed to do was be good cooks. That was it. God even prepared the bread for them. Verse 14, and when the dew lay that, that was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round things as small as the horse frost of the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, or what is it, is what it's translating to. What is it? As they say, it is manna, they're actually saying, what is it? For they knew not what it was. And Moses says to them, this is the bread which the Lord had given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Now, this is the ordinance. Remember what he said over here uh, in, in uh, Exodus 15 and 25? Remember where he said uh, he made for them there a, a statue for an ordinance, and then he uh, he gave them that, that he would prove them? So down here is his statue. Here's the ordinance that he was telling them here. This is the thing in verse 16 that the Lord has commanded. Gather it up, every man, according to his eating, an omer for every man. And an omer equates to about two quarts. So they were to take no more than two quarts, if you will, uh, as far as the bread goes. Amen. So 
uh, but going on with this, gather up every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of persons. Take ye every man for them which are of which are in his tents. So every person that belongs to a tent, they need to take no more than two quarts with them. Amen. No more than that. But it's really sp uh, specified towards the appetite of the individual, how much they can eat. Um, one person probably would be able to eat five. Another one would be able to eat two. Amen. So you would take it according to what you would be able to eat, but no more than the, than the old more than the two quarts thereof. Um, uh, for every man according to that which every man of them was able to eat within his tent. And the children of Israel did so when gathered, some more, some less. And when they did uh, measure out the omer of it, uh, when you when it did meet with an omer, when they measured out the omer, uh, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They, uh, they gathered every man according to his eating. So the person that gathered just enough uh the person that gathered uh, uh a little uh if i gathered seven and then somebody else gathered two once i ate that seven i was full if somebody ate that two they were full because they gathered according to their specified appetite amen uh, verse 8 verse 19 and moses said let no man leave it till the morning Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses, but some left it until the morning, and the bread, and it bred worms, and it stank. That Moses was angry with them. So, what whatever they had, uh, you can tell that in some cases they may have taken too much, um, because whatever was left over, or maybe no, maybe it's not that they left too much. Maybe they they took enough for their appetite, but then they said, you know what. Uh, instead of eating all this tonight, I'm gonna leave some for the morning. Well, they didn't. They didn't do the right thing. Uh, in the morning, the Lord seeing to it that they that they have fresh bread daily. He wanted them to have. He wanted them to have the best fresh bread daily. So they got it. They got to the point was like, well, I'll eat some tonight, not eat some in the morning. Well, that bread that they put put aside in the morning time, it began to rot. And 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 it to the to the point that it stunk. It smelled so bad, and then all of a sudden it attracted worms. Amen. And and Moses got angry. You know, he smelled the stench. What's what's that smell? And when he come and investigate, he sees these worms, these maggot like these worms in the midst of all this bread, because these people had the idea instead of them listening, following it to a T. You ever had kids that you tell them? When you get done with the dishes, I need you to dry the dishes. After the dishes are dried, I need you to stack the dishes in the cabinet. And so when you come in the kitchen, you find the dishes being dried in the dish rack. But you don't see, but your intentions were, as you explained to them, to take a towel and dry the dishes. And once they were dried, to assemble the dishes back in the cabinet. Um... But the children was like, well, I'm still drying the dishes. They're just being dried in the rack. The problem with you drying in the rack is that's not the order that I specified. There was never no mention of racks coming into the conversation when I told you to wash, dry, and put up. You know, well, because they didn't follow it to the T, they began to impose their will. And as you see, their will, their will brought on rotten, it brought on rottenness or brought diseases. Because if you see, it stunk and then it, it brought, it breeded worms, which thrives, uh, 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 you know, off of, off of crap, if you will, off of gunk, um, Remember when God said, I won't bring any of these diseases upon you. So you see these worms feeding or and thriving off of this uh, off of this this ailment, the rottenness of it. And the rottenness come off of their sin because they're disobedient. Amen. Uh verse 21. And gathered, it says, and they gathered it every every uh every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun was hot, it melted. Um, so the stuff that was left on the ground 
you know, they went on out and they gathered their bread and the bread that was gathered, the Lord made sure that the sun itself melted it. Otherwise, if he didn't do that, then in the morning time, that place would reek with, with rotten food. But the Lord disposed of it by allowing it to melt in the midst of the sun. Um, and it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers, which is about four quarts worth. Uh, for one man and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses and he said unto them this is that which the Lord has said tomorrow is the rest is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord bake that which you will bake today and seethe or boil if you will boil that which you will boil and that which remaineth that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning now, that was the only time that they were supposed to leave any manna until the morning. It was because it was the, the next day, it was the Sabbath. On the sixth day, it was okay. It, they were to cook, they were to boil, however they wanted pre to prepare the flesh or prepare the quail. Um, and it was okay for the manna for that. When they gathered manna, they gathered the double portion of manna. That double portion wouldn't spoil it, they would keep it until the next day because the, the next day they weren't allowed to go out and gather because the Lord wanted them to rest. Amen. Um, that was the way he, he, you know, the ordinances that he set. Verse 24, and they laid it up to the morning and Moses, he begged them, he pleaded with them or, or as he, as Moses commanded, I should say, um, and it did not stink, neither was there any worms therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh, which is of the Sabbath, and in it there shall be none. Amen. Uh verse there should be found none. Verse twenty uh verse twenty eight. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? Remember, Moses had to answer for them. Uh, See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he's given you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, and let no man go out on his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like the corn, it was like the corn their seed white and taste of it was like wafer made with honey but they were found going out um on a sabbath day to gather some food but there was none and so the lord took issue with moses how long will you allow them to keep doing this you know let them know reiterate like what i said they need to stay put in their place on the sabbath they're to rest Amen. Some of us, we're so active, we don't know how to sit down. And I get that that this might be some of what was happening with them. Sometimes our extracurricular activities will have us so busy that we don't know how to stay put. We always got to be mobile. And a lot of times your feet will get you in trouble because your feet don't know how to rest. Amen. But the Lord seen to it that he, would, he established the law that they cannot move on the Sabbath. To stay put and rest. Enjoy, enjoy rest. Amen. Verse 32. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for generations. Fill two quarts of two quarts worth of it that it can be kept. It says, and they, it says, that they may see the bread wherewith I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. So God is saying to Moses, I need y'all to go get about two quarts uh, of this manna. And the reason why I want you to gather two quarts, I need you to keep it because your, your people, your generations to come, I want them to see uh, what kind of food, uh, what was your first food that I've given you uh, upon you, uh, upon delivering you from the Egyptians, bringing you out of the land and into the wilderness. Uh, I want this to testify so that they would know these stories are real, uh, that they can see and see how this bread won't lose its value. It won't, it won't, it won't uh, disintegrate. It won't deteriorate. 
It, it won't rot. It won't spoil. I want them to see that this very manner that, that, that you're putting up, they'll believe these stories when they see me maintaining the integrity of the manna itself. Uh, verse 33, And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept uh, for your generation. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came into the land and inhabited it. And they did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. Not an omer, not an omer. Now, an omer is a tenth part of an ephod. And an ephod is, is considered, at least the measurement of it is one bushel or at least 35 liters. Amen. So we can stop right there. And um, I, I, as we stop, I want you to take note to uh, Exodus 16 and 35. And, and it says, And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. And it's talking about Canaan. It's saying that it took them 40 years to get to, uh, to, get to uh, um, the land of Canaan. So right off the bat, you ought to know how the rest of Exodus is going to play out. And, and this is why we say this. Because if you remember in the book of Genesis... When um, when Joseph sent for his father Jacob, it never took it never took Joseph. <laughs> it never took the people that that went to go get and and I think it was his other brothers that went back to get Jacob and the rest of his household. It never took them forty years to go to Egypt to Canaan, and it never took it never took uh, Jacob forty years to go from Canaan to Egypt. It only took probably a day or two so if you look that this is taking some 40 years what was going on that that it took them 40 years to get to canaan because the the mission is to bring you up out of egypt and bring you into the land that god promised uh, uh to to uh, jacob that it would be their land the land of canaan the mission was to bring you from egypt to Canaan and let you dwell in the land that was being prepared for you. Amen. Why did why did they eat manna for why did it take them 40 years to get there? Well, stick with me in the Bible. I guess I'm kind of selling the rest of the Bible study so that you'll stay with us. Amen. Um, anyway, uh, this is the time in our Bible study where uh, we take this opportunity to open the, the doors to the gates of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and the question that I want to ask you is, if something happened and you died tonight, are you confident about where you spent, where you would spend the rest of your life? That's the question that I, I, I want you to answer for yourself. If something happened that, that you should die tonight, are you confident about where you would spend? Are you confident about going to heaven and being with God? Or are you confident about going to hell? Huh? I need you to answer. See, my my job is to bring you over to God and, and give you the choice to love him because he already loves you. Now, if you answered uh, that you're confident that you will be with God if you die, then this pretty much isn't for you. But those of you that don't know then that's not real faith. I want you to stick with me just for a few minutes here because we want to make sure that you know by the time we're done. Amen. We want to make sure that you know. Now, go with me real quick. Those of you that don't have the Bible, but you're doing it on a computer, go with me real quick to Romans 10th chapter. Romans 10, uh, beginning at uh, verse uh, verse 8. Let's start with verse eight, Romans 10, verse eight. <clears throat> we did what you, what we want to do is to make sure that if you die tonight, you're okay. You know, you spend the rest of your life with God. And these questions have to be asked now because we're dealing with the magnitude of storms uh, in the likes of that we've never seen before. These kind of storms, we've experienced some of these storms in the, in the springtime. Amen. 
And these storms in the summertime, then the spring and summer, these storms were masses. I remember one time I went fishing. <laughs> this is not, yeah, just gonna give me a, a moment to tell you this quick story here. I, I went fishing uh, out in Lake George in, in, in uh, Hobart, Indiana. <laughs> and I happened to be on the lake there, obviously Lake George. And, and the, I seen the cloud. This is, this is probably about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I watched the sun darken. I watched the sky darken, man. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I knew it was time to pack it up. You knew that there was a storm on the horizon. And um, in the midst of this, I, you know, I love the fish, right? So in the midst of this, I see this guy come out. <laughs> and, and I'm packing my gear up because it's an eerie darkness. I'm packing my gear. And I see this guy comes and he unpacks his gear. He piques my curiosity, right? So I, I walks over to the guy and I said, is fishing good? And I just started taking up fishing this year. So I says to the guy, is, is good fishing in the, in the, in the storm, in the, in the rain? He said, no, perfect fishing. And I said, okay, well, I'm not going to let this guy punk me. I'm going to go on the fish too. He, you know, I don't care how eerie it's looking. I'm going to get this thing done. If he can fish, I can fish too. This guy lighting up a cigarette and everything else, right? <laughs> it starts to rain. And all of a sudden, this wind, unlike anything I've ever felt before, starts blowing me around. And the hail start coming down. And this hail was so big and so hard, it was busting me on top of my head. And the only thing that I can really protect myself with was this bucket, man, that I was going to... I didn't catch any fish because I just got there and it was just like a half hour before it started raining. But I put this bucket over my head and I can hit this... I can hear the hail hitting the bucket, man. I mean, just just battering the bucket. I finally ran to this canopy that was out there on the lake and stood under there until the um, until the hail stopped. And then all of a sudden the hail stops and the rain starts just coming down hard. I make a dash to this bridge that have an, uh, an overhang, an, an overhead on it and where there was some covering for myself. I make this mad dash there and uh, this rain came down so hard and this wind... I've never seen anything quite like it before. Uh, I'm saying all that to say the magnitude of storms that we're experiencing now. Uh, as they're, they're starting to say that this is going to be a normal for us. And these are like killer storms, folks. If you haven't had, if you haven't given your life over to Jesus, you can be out fishing and end up losing your life over one of these storms. Amen. You can be out fishing. The days that we that that we were warned about some storms and we just said, ah, I weather the storm. You got to really pay attention to 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 the magnitude of them now, because that decision that you make in this stay put, you might be costing you your life. Now, if you if you if if you end up succumbing to one of these storms or anything else in life. Are you confident about where you where you will go? And we want to answer this. As I said, go with me to Romans 10 chapter beginning at verse 8. It says, but what saith it? The word is near unto you, even in the mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So I'm preaching to you faith right now. This word is near to you. Let this word penetrate your heart. Penetrate your heart so that you can confess it out of your mouth. Verse 9, and here it is. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's all it takes. If you are having problems, uh, 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 knowing if you're going to if you're going to spend the rest of your life with God, if you if you're not confident in that, then we want to take care of that right now because it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how severe your crime was, 
It doesn't matter. The, the, the only thing that matters is that you don't lie, that you don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Outside of that, it does not matter uh, what you've done. I don't care if it was rape. I don't care if it was murder. These crimes are heinous. I don't care if it was adultery. These, these crimes are heinous. I'm not giving you permission to do those things that I just said. But what I am saying is it doesn't have to cost you your salvation. Amen. There is forgiveness. You're going to reap what you sow because you got to pay for the crimes that you commit. But when it comes to eternal life, no matter what you've done, you can be forgiven for. All it takes is for you to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, who is Jesus? Go with me to John 3, 16. The gospel according to John uh, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. This is who Jesus Christ is. This is answering who Jesus is. It's the son of God. God so loved the world. And when it said he loved world, he loved the world. He ain't talking about the buildings. He's talking about the men that make up this world. The people that make up this world. God so loved the people that he gave his only begotten child. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when it said God so loved the world, it's not saying that the buildings need to believe on God. It's not saying that the trees need to believe on Jesus. That's not, a, it's saying that you, you are the world that he's talking about. Now, Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, uh, then you shall be saved. Now, if you are ready to solidify, because I want you out, stop looking at what you've done. Stop looking at where you've been. Stop looking at how you are. Stop that. All you need to do is start looking at God right now. See, you keep looking at yourself through the devil's eyes and judging yourself. And you're thinking that you can't be saved. I'm telling you that you can and you will be saved. The only thing you need to do is believe this thing in your heart. So if you're ready, I want you to say this with me because here's the word that I'm preaching to you that I need you to take. This is what you believe. You say, God, and you repeat this with me. You say, God, I come to you right now and I come to you just as I am. You say, God, you know where I've been and you know where I stand. You know where I stand, God. He said, God, I'm asking you to forgive me for every last one of my sins right now. Now, you confess Jesus to God. You say, God, I believe that Jesus the Christ is your only begotten child. And God, I believe out of love for the world, you sent your son Jesus to this earth and that he died. He allowed men to take his life, God that I may have life eternally. I believe God on the third day of Jesus' death, you resurrected him from the dead and soon after ascended him up into heaven, allowing him to become the, the king of kings and the firstborn of the dead, God. Now you call on Jesus. You say, Jesus, I call on you right now to forgive me for my sins to clean me up and clean me out. Wash me with your blood that I may be whiter than snow. You say, Jesus, live in me and live through me from this day forward. I surrender and I submit. You are my Lord. You are my King. If you said it and you meant it, you believe that within your heart and you confessed it, then praise God, without a doubt, you are saved. Don't worry about this cleaning process. Don't worry about the, 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 the things that you had a hard time breaking away from. God, just like he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he is going, he just delivered you from the hands of the enemy. And just like he's feeding them, just like he fed uh, uh, Israel, amen, He's going to feed you too. He's going to clean you up. He's going to provide for you now. You know why? Because he just purchased you. 
he just purchased you. You belong to him. You have his, his, his insignia on your heart now. Amen. You belong to Jesus. Amen. Now, we got to get you baptized. What does baptism represent? It, repre it represents us dying. Uh, it, it, it's the burial of the old man and the resurrection of the new man in the Lord Jesus Christ. It represents us being buried and rising with Jesus. It is to say it's ceremonial. A man of God will take you and he's going to submerge you into a tank of water and then he'll, which represents our burying in Christ. And then immediately the man of God will pull you up from the water, uh, which represents us rising in Christ Jesus. You want to call a man of God uh, and let him know that, that uh, you've given your life over to Jesus and he is your Lord and Savior. And, and what Lord and Savior means is that you're ready to live for him. Just like the scripture says, just like God wanted to test him, he wanted them to follow his ordinances. What you do now is you start praying to him. You, you, you start bringing in this, his word, those things that we're learning. That's his ordinances now. He is going to start to fill you up with his word, with his bread. Remember how the children of Israel, uh, they were taking in all this bread to be full now you're going to do the same thing with, with this word. Jesus is the bread of life. You're going to take this word and you're going to fill yourself with it. In you will be life and in you will be the word. It's going to be word. It's going to be life. It's going to be the ordinances of God. Amen. He's going to clean you up and he's going to provide. Amen. So I had a fantastic time. Oh, by the way, let that man of God know that you want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't do the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is the Lord Jesus, which is the Lord God, Jesus, the Son of God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ meaning the Holy One, which is uh, the Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Um, had a fantastic time, enjoyed, uh, the Bible study, enjoy God saying what he said, you know, and, uh, take that, what you've learned and share it. Go tell somebody, tell somebody to check out our, check out our Bible studies. Amen. Tell them to check out the faith challenges that are on our website until we meet again. My brothers and sisters, don't forget about those that are in your areas. They can use your help. Those that are on the East Coast that have been paralyzed by the storms, they can use your help. Until we meet again, peace be upon you uh, and your families in the name of our Lord and Savior. And you can say it with me, our Lord and Savior. Praise God, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen.